writer whose work has um, been praised uh, since he got his first word published, it seems. <laughs> and, um, not exactly. Not exactly, no. <laughs> but you, know, you pretty don't. Good, pretty good track record in uh, Caleb's new book, The Legend of, I'm going to pronounce it Brocken, but it might be. It is broken. 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 Um, is a amazingly imagined tale of the 8th century in the Dark Ages, and it explores uh, themes of, of military daring do, uh, plagues, conflicts between <laughs> cultures, all in uh, just an amazing panorama of... of um, we're All the good story. stuff. A great storyteller, he is. Um, the reviews in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, you know, make comparisons or uh, references to J.R.R. Tolkien and George R.R. R. Martin, and we have Mr. Carr, who has a couple of R's in his name too. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, I didn't think of that. Uh, but anyway. Please welcome Caleb Carr. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the, the, the connections to George Martin and to Tolkien. Uh, if you go in expecting that, you might be disappointed. There's actually, in the, in the Wall Street Journal, there are mentions of... Naturally, you know, I have to go farther back for inspiration. Um, and they actually got it right by mentioning people like H. Ryder Haggard or uh, even Arthur Conan Doyle, the stuff that he did with The Lost World. It's, it is a little difficult, as, as the Wall Street Journal critic said, um, it's a little difficult now to write tales of lost worlds because we think we know everything about everything. And it turns out that we don't. There still are enormous dark spots in history that we have no idea what took place, who lived there, how they spoke. Um, and the area in Europe that I was writing about, that I set this in, is one of those. It just, it just struck me as so incredible that we don't know. And, and, and there's really no farther people can go with it. Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing left behind. There's nothing, they don't know why, there, in many cases they don't know why there's nothing left behind, but there isn't anything left behind. Um, you know, even the Mayans left their, their ruins. We don't know what on earth happened to them. Um, although I'm sort of inclined to agree with Colin Quinn that being a drug culture, they simply disappeared. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of writing these kinds of stories, if you're a historian, you know, it's, it's, what I did in The Alienist was fit people into blank spots in other people's lives. Like, I took portions of people's lives, known people's lives, where there were blank spots, where you could have fit action, other action into, into their lives. But this spread out into a whole world. Um, that eventually that rose and eventually collapsed and eventually was erased, and why and how that happened, and that's the basic. That's the basic conceit of it. Um, the difference between, you know, I'm happy to have comparisons to Tolkien and and Martin are are flattering. My only worry is that people go in expecting dragons, and that they're not going to get them. There's this is a real this is the real world in which the need for explanations like dragons 
hopefully is at least largely explained. Um, it was it was it was certainly a dark age in terms of knowledge and science, but science did would and did explain what was going on. It's just that because of the rise, basically of the rise of the Catholic Church, all science, all scientific exploration, experimentation was basically closed. And in, from, the, from the time of really of the late Romans, the late Roman scientists until the 16th century, you don't get any advance. And the reason you don't get any advance is because of the rise of the monotheistic real religions that did not allow any significant investigation. Um, and that, but, but, but that shouldn't, but that didn't and wouldn't necessarily have stopped anybody from doing it. They would have paid a heavy price, as the people in this book who make that kind of investigation pay a heavy price. Um, but it still could have gone on. So that's really, that's really the world. Um, Broken I picked because originally it was it's it's sort of fascinating. It's it's on a I live at the base of a mountain which is which I I shudder to say I own um, uh, called Misery. And um, Misery Mountain is about the same elevation uh, forestation. Everything about it is is very similar to Broken. I was stunned by the similarities in seeing both. Um, and it's it makes sense. It's on the same sort of um, latitude. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's roughly on the same latitude. Um, northern Germany is very much like northern central Germany is very much like our our own area, um, which is why I think so many German immigrants found this area congenial. Um, it was a, it was very much what they were used to, and um, I can't think of any other reason why there should have been such a heavy concentration of Germans, in particular, in the nineteenth century, to the, to this area and the area north of here. Um, so I had a place that was like a place. I, uh, I was living in a place that was like the place that I was going to write about. And then all what happens when you write these historical things is if things start to fall into place, then, you know, there, if there are strange coincidences that aren't really coincidences th th that start to fall into place, then you know you've picked the right thing. You, sometimes you'll pick a historical period and you just keep running up against facts. You say, so, well, we can't really do that. We can't really do that. It's, it, it's not, it wasn't feasible. It wasn't, you know, that's going to be utterly anachronistic. Not that that bothers a lot of people, but it bothers me. And um, in this one, you just, the doors just kept opening um, right up until modern times. Um, you know uh, the mountain Brocken, which is which is what Broken is based on, um, was was got the reputation for being um, a sort of a play a, a, a demonic kind of a uh, locale, 
and eventually was used by, by Goethe in Faust. It was used as the Walpurgisnacht scene, the scene that takes place there with the witches and the, and the demons ceremony takes place on that mountain. And so um, by modern times, it was well established as a kind of a, 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 an accursed place um, which didn't stop the Nazis from building the world's first significant television broadcasting center on top of it, which was where the 1936 Olympics were broadcast from. Um, of course, the Americans then bombed the daylights out of it. And um, then it, be, it became a sort of super secret spying, listening, and military training station for the East Germans who surrounded the top of the mountain with walls, very much like the walls that I describe in the book, um, only they use concrete. So it's, it's just, when you see all these things start to, start to gather together, and you, then you're given this enormous gap in time where we, we just don't know. What, what, what it is. Um, why did he get that reputation? Nobody knows. Um, so those are just doors that open that you can, you can really fill with whatever you want to. And I happen to fill it with this. I'm not sure the Germans are pleased about it, but um, I don't know why they wouldn't be, but they don't seem to be. Um, but that's basically how it came to be. To describe, to describe the story in any more <laughs> detail, I mean, to give you this, it's one of those stories that's, you know, being, being, um, I'll get half a sentence out of my mouth and say, but then you got to understand that, didn't, the, you know, it's, 12 different plots going off in, 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 in directions that eventually come together, but it would be more time than you'd want to spend listening to, to the plot itself. But that's the, that's the kind of setting and, the, and, and how, it, how it came to be. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad that, some, that there are some critics left in the world who, are, who take the time with books like this, we you know we live in a we live in a weird time um, for books. It's we're going backwards a little bit in terms of in the '90s there were a lot of us who fought very hard against the idea of genres and genre fiction being somehow different and lower than literary fiction. And what did the two mean anyway? When I published The Alienist, there were people who actually objected strenuously to it being called a novel. Um, I, I asked them, you know, why, why? And it's because they looked at novels as being literary creations and literary fiction has to do with the personal, with writing what you know in your direct experience. And my answer to that was, why can't your direct experience be expanded outward into a world that's representational, but is still emotionally very much your own experience? For which, generally, I got backs turned on me and harumphed. Um, but there were a lot of us who really did um, try very hard to blur that line. All of those lines. Um, the lines between genres, the, line be the lines between genre fiction and literary fiction, just, just to, because it, 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 it did nothing but it did not, nothing but keep people away from books. It, 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 you know, the, the idea of literature, then all of a sudden, literature becomes something that makes especially young people just moan, you know. And it's, that's not, 
you know, if literature can also be books that are actually fun to read or enjoyable to read, um, and then maybe when you get older you can read some of the some of the more difficult stuff. But it it there's got to be more ways into books than Harry Potter. Um, but we seem to be falling backwards now, and it's I don't know if it's the I don't know if it's the rise of the ebook that's doing it. Um, I don't think so, but I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure that the process of getting up and going to a bookstore and being you know being around people who are around books isn't something that is very, I spent mo a lot of my youth, early youth in bookstores and it was a very deeply imprinting experience. And I don't know if that's what it is, if, if, if just pressing a button on your computer gets you a book, uh, makes it some, makes you somehow lazier in your brain at the same time. I'm not sure. It's a, it's, it, I'm literally not sure, it's a, it's, a, it's a thought I've had, but there's something that's making us slip back to, okay, here's the books that people actually buy, and here's the books that people ought to read. And um, you're, you're seeing people, you're seeing authors give up in discouragement. You know, you see, you, you'll see a lot of, there are a lot of, "Quote unquote literary authors who are just giving up in discouragement, um, and there are a lot of people on the, the side of the books that are quote unquote fun to read, who shouldn't even be published. Um, I mean, they, not to say they shouldn't be published. I'm not going to. I'm not Joseph Goebbels. I'm. I'm not. I'm not going to decide what should be published, but." It's kind of like you just can't believe. Well, maybe somebody here can explain it to me. But, um, you know, the Fifty Shades of Grey syndrome is beyond me. We, we, have, we, have, we have passed out of my area of understanding. It's almost like being in a spaceship and you feel like you've passed out of the, out of the region that anyone knows anything about. It just... It just astounds me, um, and if that's offensive to anyone, I apologize, but I don't get it. Um, there was a remark that the Wall Street Journal guy made uh, in reviewing Broken. The con concluding remark, which, which struck me very deeply, he said, you know, this is, got, this is not an easy book to read, but the more you get it, the more you put in, the more you'll get out. And I thought to myself, that, that ought to be true of all books. Books aren't television. I mean, they're, 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 they're really interactive in the deepest sense, experiences. You, you have to, you have to want, you know, the books that I grew up with, you know, that influenced me the most, you know, I read War and Peace twice before I was twenty. Now that book, you've got to, you've got to want to read that book. You've got to really want to read that book. But if you do, it's it's going to pay off in 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 a thousand different ways. Um, and I won't, you know, that's, and, and War and Peace is easy compared to Moby Dick. It's like, these, this is, this is, but this is the, this is the literature of all time. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that things being easy to read really serves the public. But. I'm not sure that I even know right now what the public's up to. It's a strange time. That's all I can say. It's a strange time. I used to say, I, I used to think I know, knew where American culture was going. Now, 
I, I doubt anybody does. It's, it's so fractionalized and so weird for that reason. And on that unhappy note, <laughs> I'd love to take some questions. I do. I do. I actually, in thinking about it more, here's the, here's the thing. I don't think, I think if ebooks had come along as an independent thing and there'd been no internet, you know, if there'd been a box that you had at home and you could have downloaded books, I don't think it would have changed anything. Um, I do think it's the internet. The internet is the most devilishly, and I, I mean that literally. It is it, the, the, the internet travels under the guise of being a convenience and worst of all, a connective instrument. When what it is doing, slowly but surely, it is not connecting people to people. It is isolating people at home. People are sitting at home, sitting in front of their computers with whatever, you know, many of them developing addi addictions to whatever, not even the obvious things, not even gambling or pornography or anything. I mean, you can get addicted to anything on the internet. Um, you can get addicted to one person's blog and just sit there and, you know, it's like, and you don't know who that person is. You have no idea. And people say, oh, no, I know. I know. And it's like, no, you don't. Have you met him? No, but I know him. It's like, I love these things. It's, it, I love that statement constantly from people. No, have you met him? No, but I know him. I know him from, from, from the internet. Um, and yes, there are happy stories of people who, you know, meet each other and have relationships because of the, you know, they meet on the internet. Um, I, I can't, I always laugh because a good friend of mine in New York met his current girlfriend <laughs> while they were playing internet backgammon. And I just thought to myself, how does that work? <laughs> what's, what's the line, you know? Hey, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> did you see what I just did to you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just, I don't know. Don't you think there's something, the thing that's missing from the internet and from ebooks is, well, not just the artistry. I mean, you could write, your words could appear on a screen that right. easily is on a page. But there is something sensuous about engaging your hands and, uh, and eyeballs and the weight of the yes. and so on that... Um, makes, I don't know, puts you in the story yep. <laughs> more than... I do think that's the, the, I do think that's the key, the key diff, the physical difference there is, first of all, you can't erase this, this, with a touch of a button. And everybody, when they buy a book, I mean, I've had this conversation. This, you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. I've sort of, I was just saying before, I've kind of given in on the, on the e-books thing because it's just, it's just too overwhelming. I mean, it's like at this point, to fight the fight against e-books is, is, is you're losing. You're just going to spend, your, you're, just, you're just shouting against the wind. But the, the truth is, the physical form of a book draws you in in a way that an ebook cannot. And also, every person, if I buy this book and you buy this book, we've bought two different books. My book's not like your book. And you'll see people looking around. If you put a, you know, there'll be a table full of books, and people will say, where's my book? And there's 12 copies of the same book. And somebody will say, well, well, isn't that it? No, no, no. I'm looking for my book. And it's, there's something about it that makes each the experience. Every one of us takes away a different experience. And a lot of that is physical. And it's sensual. And it's, it's 
there's something that is just poof gone and that's a lot of people say that they get the same now you can argue the other way I think that the reading experience is personal and I personally prefer a book than an ebook although I've learned to read on an ebook for reasons of travel and things like that um, I think though that the, what I'm really responding more is the idea I, I agree on the reading experience, but I think what the other part that you were talking about and what I talk about a little, what I think about a lot because being in publishing, I think about it every minute of the day like you do, is that um, I think there's a dumbing down because of, of readers because you think you're so smart because you get so much information off the internet and you're really not because it's bleeding and nothing sticks. Mm -hmm. And we want things quickly and then we expect it. We don't stop and think and digest. And there's a, a different way that you think when you gather information from the internet than when you read a book or even read an ebook, I will argue. Um, and I think that that changes the mentality of the reader to take the time to really digest and, and think about an experience of such a, you know, an in depth book like, the, you know, like your book versus. A Fifty Shades of Grey or a Twilight or any of the other things that are kind of more fleeting in that way where it takes less, it's, it's just pure, you can call it pleasure or whatever you want to call it, but you don't have to have the depth of thought. And even if you have the depth of thought, I'm not sure you get as much out of it as reading your work. Well, you're not supposed to be reading Twilight. <laughs> Let's get, let's, get that, let's get I that straight it. right out. <laughs> but it's not like reading this. I'll read anything. So I'm not... Um, but... Not, I think there's a difference in terms of the way we think that is different. No, than that's, physical that's unquestionably true. And also, but I'd argue at the same time with a reader, with, a, with an electronic reader, with a book, you can't jump out into, you know, you press a button, you get tired of, oh, I'm tired of reading. Boom. Up comes some game to play. Boom. Up comes a newspaper to read. Boom. Up you know, you, you've got, the, you got all this other stuff to distract you. A book is a dedicated thing. But it's, it's not as easy. It's not as easy. I'm telling you, these little movements, and, and somebody's going to do a great book about it one day, you know, these little movements that are involved in not sitting at the computer, you know, the little movement of going to the television and having to turn it on and find something to watch, you know, the little movements of putting down the book and going to get something to eat, the little, you know, or going to find some other amusement, these things are being lost. People are coming home, sitting down, and they don't move. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. And, and, and all of the science on this is bad. It's really bad. It's destructive to health. It's destructive to Relationship. relationships. I mean, the great, I always go back to the great, William Gibson, who wrote Neuromancer, the first who coined the phrase cyberspace and was the, really the great genius behind, fictionally behind all of this stuff. I mean, you know, the, the Matrix just completely stole Neuromancer because Neuromancer was deemed too tough a book to make, a story I've uh, heard before. Um, but he said many years ago, when it was really at the beginning, he said, the internet is good for um, pornography and buying things. He said it's a silly, you, basically it's a, it's a base silly instrument and that's good because if it ever becomes anything more, it's going to be the most dangerous thing in the world. And this is the guy who, you know, you never would have believed he would say this because he had imagined the world that that it was going to be, and um, it was It's not. A, it's not a happy world, you know. It's really not a happy world where people exist. In you know, he created the idea of people jacking in and existing in actually inside the machine, in cyberspace. And I don't know, you know, if they came out tomorrow with that, 
if, 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 you know, Xbox came out tomorrow and said, we've got a new, we got a new Xbox, but you got to have a surgical implant in the back of your head. And, um, that doesn't, but that doesn't take long. That's outpatient surgery. And then you can jack right into cyberspace. I think you'd find, I think you'd find people line up around the block to get it. It's, 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 it's. It's sad, but it's true. Well, it removes people from a kind of responsibility. If you can escape into this non-existent world, I mean, in any real sense, then you don't care what happens to the one that's you know drowning in a sea of entropy right now. Right. And, uh, right. Instead of you know, a million years, it's happening now. You don't care about it because you're living in And that's the world he predicted. I mean, the real physical world that he predicted where all these people actually live is a terrible, dark, you know, um, sea of entropy is exactly what is exactly right. Um, and I, you know, he, he eventually, he eventually became so disillusioned by what was happening, he just stopped writing. I mean, he dropped off the, he's really dropped off the map. Um, and there are a lot of people like that. There are a lot of people that just are giving up. They're like, if I have to compete with Fifty Shades of Grey, I quit. You know, and that's, that's a, f I've heard that from people more than once. You know, if that's what I have to compete with, I give up. Now, you know, you can say to yourself, well, is, that re is this really any worse than it was 30, 40 years ago? I mean, is this really worse than Harold Robbins or Jacqueline Suzanne? You know, is, this, is, is it really worse? Yeah, it is worse because it's stupider. Believe it or not, it's stupider. It's, 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 it's um, the great thing about Jacqueline Suzanne and people, Hal Robbins, people like that, they really believed that stuff. They were real adults and they really believed all that crap they wrote and they wrote it in detail and they researched it and it was really, you know, argue with it all you want to, but they honestly believed it. This, this Fifty Shades of Grey, Twilight is written better than this stuff. I mean, this, it's written for it's written at about an eighth grade level. Isn't it like eating, though? I, the old phrase that eating opens up the appetite. You start to, you know, you're not hungry, then you eat a little bit, and the next thing you know, you're hungry. So that reading that some people are doing for the first time because they've heard this is a great, dirty book, and they're reading it, and yeah, they like it. So they're going to pick up another book, aren't they? That's what, that's what everybody said about Harry Potter. This is Harry Potter. Your kids are reading Harry Potter, and when they're done with Harry Potter, they're going to go on to the great classics of all time. Well, and or, guess or what? Step someplace in, yeah, and guess what? It, they didn't go to any, even a middling step. Didn't happen. They stopped at the end of Harry Potter. Go back to the, to the author's next book. It's the same sales as what the book was prior to the open set. It, and they never you know, accumulate that. It is interesting. Mm -hmm. it, it, they did, Harvard did a study on it where they, where they went out to find, you know, what are the kids actually reading after Harry Potter? Nothing. I, I they're, waiting for, they're waiting for the next Harry Potter. They're watching the movies over and over again. And if, they can't, if there's no more Harry Potter, as there isn't now, they're not reading anything. I, I just want to tell you from my experience as 30 years of a junior high school, middle school, inner city teacher trying to ignite them. <clears throat> What you said is exactly true. Uh, something would come along, the uh, Hunger Games. They'll right. read the Hunger Games. They'll go to the movie. But I can't get them interested in, in, in anything else like it anymore, dystopian, anymore this, anymore science. Fiction. It's just the next big thing. They're, they're in on it, but it does not carry over at all in any way. No. It's very sad. It's, it's, and they're designed. These things are really designed to do that. That's the, that's the sort of sad sickness about it. 
you know I mean they're set up and and publicized and marketed that way this is the only thing you know this is the you gotta read this and if you're not reading this nothing else is gonna do there's no there's no suggestion of you know tying in to any, to, to anything else um, and I I think that's just Unfortunately, that is that is a quality that the writers themselves have. Um, you know, J.K. Rowling, who is now the richest woman in the world, stunning. Um, you know. If you go through Harry Potter, you can just pick out where in popular culture she lifted what. It's just it's just plagiarism after plagiarism after plagiarism, um, and that's you know they are the products of popular culture, and and they've produced more popular culture. Um, that's the really sad thing, and that's what I worry about with the ebooks. Is is, you know, are people people say, oh, but you know, it's not just current fiction that you can download. You can download all the all classic literature. Are you? I don't know. The last, uh, you know, it 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 it. Are you inclined to download War and Peace on your reader? I don't know. I'm not sure that you are if you see, you know, advertisements for all this, the way it's all set up. It's also, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm the voice of doom on this, maybe. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, you know, it's funny because when I was writing Broken, people said, you know, well, if it's it sounds it sounds sort of like kids could read this book. And I said, yeah, kids could read this book. He said, but, you know, your books have an awful lot of violence and sick stuff in them. I said, well... We're going to tone that down maybe a little bit to make it more suggestive than explicit. And then the, from the same people, they mean the, the going in sort of logical circles, they're like, yeah, but if you tone that stuff down, that's what people will come to expect from you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's just... You know, you do what the story demands. Um, I, I, I don't know if, 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 if this book finds anything like the readership of George Martin or Tolkien or or any of them. I'll I'll be delighted, of course. Um, but there are prof there are profound differences. It's a tougher book to read. It's a tougher book to read. There's no question. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about the research that went into it? A lot. <laughs> sure. A lot. Um, it was really just like I described. It's a. It's a. It's a matter of doors start swinging open. There was the physical research of the place itself. There was the um, then there were, I mean, it was right down to, you know, because you had to make sure the language wasn't anachronistic. So almost every word in the book had to be checked. The etymology had to be checked to make sure that it wasn't some 20th century anachronism. Um, the language had to be checked. The clothing had to be checked. Um, I mean, right down to 
you know, why did people wear what they wore? Um, everything about daily life had to be checked. Um, the diseases, God, the, the, the educate, I thought that educating myself in 19th century psychiatry and psychology was going to be enough, but educating myself in basically what was 5th fifth, fifth century medicine, Lord above, that takes some work. It, it, it actually is fascinating, but boy, time goes by when you're, when you're doing that kind of research. Time just months fly by and you don't realize it. Um, it, 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 it was on every level. It, the research was on every level. Because there was no point at which, and this was the thing about which I was the most adamant, there was no point at which any character was going to be able to say, poof, that's just that way because I want it to be that way. There was no, no reliance on magic, no reliance on... Magic is fine for people who enjoy it. Um, I, I, it's, to me, it is such a, such a plot contrivance. Um, my 10-year-old niece once came to me, she's not 10 anymore, but this was years ago when Harry Potter was first starting, and she'd read the first few books, and she's, she's particularly bright and sort of acid in her comments about books, and she stormed in after reading about the third or fourth Harry Potter book and said, I'm not reading this anymore. Everybody's got a wand, and all the wands do anything. <laughs> It's like, I want to watch. <laughs> it's like, poof. And I said, well, there you go. That's exactly why I can't read them, because everybody's got a wand, and every wand does everything. And it's like, but once you drop that, once you decide that you're going to exist in the physical world in a story, you are in for a lot of research. A lot of research. And it's there. You can do it. There's people out there, you know, who are, who are researching every subject imaginable. Um, they're, I doubt they're making, you know, their primary living by doing it, but they're doing it. Um, so it's, it's, there to be, it's there to be mined. But it's hard. <laughs> it is really hard. I have never, every book I think this, oh, this is going to be easier. This is going to be easier because I don't have to do all that research about New York. This will be, you know, this is going to be some other, oh boy. You look you back. Using libraries or you using the internet? I was, <laughs> I was <laughs> <laughs> li libraries. I actually built my own library of this and I'm trying to figure out who I'm going to leave it to one day because I have this whole now this entire library of you know shelves of you know clothing uh, military arms and then military tactics and strategy and then um, you know but yeah libraries and li from libraries, you can take your, your lead in, in terms of what books to go to, for the most part. Or lemons, so you'll, you'll, still, you'll still find yourself buying the occasional lemon. You'll think, well, this, wait a minute. Um, that'll, hap that'll happen with things like Nordic runes. You know, you'll buy a book you think is a serious book on Nordic runes, and all of a sudden it turns out to be some, 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 some very, like a tarot card thing with your own little set of Nordic runes, which... Don't you have them in your pocket now? That's, no, that's, that's where I get off. I don't, I don't mess with older, ancient cultures 
voodoo I don't mess with. So how did you get this idea? Was it finding a place that had no history that was known, or what? Or did you look for that place with the idea in mind? Originally, I'll tell you, originally, this was 30 years ago, 28 years ago, that the original idea I had, I was living in New York, and it was about the changes in New York, um, and about it, so it was about a city, um, and the wilderness surrounding it, and then um, it went through sort of morphing stages, where it kept growing, growing, where the where the where the sort of allegory kept growing and growing. Um, and it became about, then it became about, you know, then I, when I, it became about the country, it became about the, the forested people, it became about, um, you know, the people who live outside of the um, people who are in the city and think they're on top of the world, uh, and in many ways are. But the allegory kept growing, and eventually it just became sort of universal. And that's the point at which you know to go. Because when it becomes nonspecific, when it becomes a sort of a universal allegory, that's the point at which you know to move forward with, 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 some, uh, with some sense of purpose. Because allegories that are tied too tightly to any one experience, um, that's why I'm convinced that's why to this day, that's why Tolkien denied until his dying day that, that, uh, that Lord of the Rings was an allegory for the Second World War, for the first, the first and then the Second World War. When it's clearly an allegory for the Second World War, I mean, it's, it's, and I don't think he wanted it to be. I don't think he liked the fact that it matched the reality that was around him so much, but how could it do anything else? Um, but I think he felt, at the time that he did it, he felt that it, it had become sort of a universal, and it, it is. I mean, I, I will give it its absolute due. It, it can be taken in a very universal sense. It doesn't have to be an allegory. It is an allegory for, for the Second World War, but it doesn't have to be. It can al be an allegory for any number of things. Um, so he was right in that sense, but it's just funny that, that uh, he would deny that one particular thing because it was, he was so afraid it would be limited to that. Uh, yeah, but you you want allegories to be as universal as possible. You don't you don't want to you don't want it to seem like you're carping about any one situation, um, which I was at the beginning, and have still been known to do when it comes to New York City. Anything else? What about Beowulf? What, what, what? What about Beowulf? What, what relation does this era have to it? That's probably the only words I can think of that I have familiarity with that maybe corresponds to either a similar or a, a, an epic of a comparable. Era. Yeah. Is it, is it a comparable era? or? It's a comparable, it's a, Beowulf's a little later. Um, Later. Yeah. And Beowulf, again, returns to this idea of the, of, of the monster, of what's out there being the monster. And what's out there was generally more people, which is why, you know, myth, myths were created, myths were created at this time 
about monsters, but they were also created about people. There's a fascinating, for instance, one of the things that really, one of the pieces of, of uh, one of the theories in researching that I came across that was so fascinating was that, you know, there's, there's the whole idea of the invasion of the, of the Gothic tribes in Europe and there's a guy who's now written this book, or a couple of years ago wrote this book, um, which basically says there's no real proof for the Gothic invasions. And the fact of the matter is that the Romans may simply have gotten to the Danube and the Rhine, they crossed the Danube and the Rhine, they ran into these people that were so ferocious and beat the tar out of them, and knocked them back across to the Rhine and the Danube. And, and so they decided, well, we need to make a, we need to create a mythology about these people. These barbarian, it's gotta be these barbarian hordes. They've gotta be these really subhuman, almost um, monstrous people because they beat us and, and nobody's done that before. Um, and it's actually an entirely plausible theory. It 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 makes a lot more sense because there's so there's there's so little evidence about. All right, well the barbarian hordes come in here, but we don't know where the barbarian hordes came from, really. Um, so. It's, it's the mythology of, I mean, you know, in a sense, this whole book is, you know, if you take Shakespeare's famous, um, you know, the known and the forest outside the known, you know, which is what many of his plays are, that's the, me that's the mechanism around it. There's the, there's the known place and then there's the, then there's the then there's the place outside, which is usually a forest. Um, sometimes it's something else. Um, but that's really that that's really a central concept that I got when I was young from a course I took um, that that dealt with Shakespeare, and that idea just stuck in my head. Because maybe it was because I was a New Yorker, and I also lived a lot of the time in the country, um, outside New York, that there was this incredible distinction between the people who dwelt in the city and everybody else who dwelt outside the city, and how they didn't even really speak the same language, although they spoke, obviously they spoke the same language, but they didn't, their terms of reference were entirely different. Because um, obviously, I mean, where I live is an extremely rural um, part of the state. So it's it's um, and and extremely poor as well. Um, any of you who've spent time in Rensselaer County or Eastern Rensselaer County know that it's it's among, if not the poorest of the. New York's counties, and it's um, the contrast between those two worlds makes you think in terms of it's 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 not hard to see how people started to think in terms of monsters being out there, but but again, Beowulf is you know it goes back to the supernatural. There's there's. There's really nothing that I can cite as an influence except, you know, the great the great 19th story, century stories and early 20th century stories of, of lost cities and lost kingdoms really were the sort of inciting um, influence behind this. Tolkien's education had to do with ancient languages, as I remember, right. German in particular, but those old, old languages. Yeah. That was his original, 
his, 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 well, his, what about your education? My education. What, what about your, you know, have you got roots like that that, uh, you know, have Not in language. Mine, mine are in, mine are in military and diplomatic history. That's what I, that's what I studied. Mostly military history. That's what I used to teach military history at Bard. And, um, and that's why in the book, as, as, Several critics have noted there's a lot of, there is a lot of military detail. A, and because that's always bothered me, my brother used to say to me, you should like Lord of the Rings. Look at all, look at all the military stuff in it. And I'd be like, what? There's two masses of people and they just crash together. Um, it's, you know, you've got to work it out more than that. <laughs> and who's fighting with what anyway? And what do they, you know, where did they get that? And, and uh, he'd turn around and shrug his shoulders and walk away at that point. But it, it's, 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 that's, that's sort of where my basis was. But then it spread out, you know. I was doing the alienist. It went into medicine. It went into psychology. And from that, it went into medicine. And, and it, it, um... It was actually pretty funny. In those days, I, I actually got a call once to speak, to be the keynote speaker at the American Psychiatric Association's annual conference. And I said, well, I'm, I'm very honored by the invitation, but you do understand that I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> and they said, oh, really? <laughs> we just assumed, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I said, okay, well. I said, I understand. It's an honest mistake. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> they were really mortified. Um, but it, it just, you know, that, my, I would say my, basically my, my background is independent, is as an independent researcher, most of all. Um, you know, when I was in school, nobody, when I was in college, nobody was teaching military history. It was, it was absolutely out and I had to make up course courses of study for myself I had to graduate and in technically in independent studies because uh, there just wasn't it was and not to mention high school which was where it really it really caught hold and boy oh boy try studying military history at a Quaker high school <laughs> in the early 70s and just see where it gets you. Uh, disgusting. I was referred to, my interests were referred to as disgusting. I always remember that. Thanks very much, Caleb. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Anybody who would like it, I would happy happy to s put my d doctor's scrawl on your <laughs> on books, books of any kind. I'll sign anything. So are you, what are you taking a break? Or are you working the? I'm not even sure I asked a question I can answer in one night. <laughs> you want me to wait till people are back? So I'll, I'll, I think I'm at the end of the line. You can give me a brief. Well, answer. yeah, let me let me get these people. Actually, if you just sign them, sure. we'll find them. You are the Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Hi. Hi.
Thank you. The I've only thing about ebooks is that nobody takes them from you. And my alien has been gone <laughs> for years, so I'm getting another one with a signature. And then this one. Yeah, well, that's true. Nobody can steal your e books. <laughs> I really, you know, like I say, I see these yeah. guys. But when did you teach at Bard? Oh, I guess it was in the middle of the 2000s for a couple of years. And you live in Manhattan now? No, no, no. I live upstate. I live about an hour and a half. <laughs> he lives on Misery Mountain. <laughs>